Thank you so much. University of Finley, go Oilers. Thank you so much for your hospitality. How about this guy? Rob Portman. What a legislator, what a leader. Rob Portman, thank you for what you do for Ohio. Thank you for what you do for America. Thank you so much. You know, another great hunter, a guy who we share trail cam photos with, Bob Latta. Bob Latta is a great member of Congress. Bob Latta, thank you for your leadership. I really appreciate what you do for us. How about Mary Taylor, too, huh? What a great lieutenant governor. And you could all do everybody a favor by making Rob Portman the senior senator of Ohio, by electing Josh Mandel the next senator from Ohio. Hey, Finley, you ready to help us win this thing? Look, this is a serious time. This is not your run-of-the-mill presidential election. We're not just deciding who's going to be president for four more years. We are making decisions at this time which will shape our nation for a generation. What kind of country we're going to leave our kids and our grandkids, what kind of people we're going to be. We've got very serious problems right in front of us. And they require real leadership and serious solutions. This, above all, is why we need to elect Mitt Romney as our next president of the United States. We need leaders who will confront our problems. Let me read you a quote that somebody said four years ago. If you don't have any fresh ideas, then you use stale tactics to scare voters. If you don't have a record to run on, then you paint your opponent as someone people should run from. You make a big election about small things. You know who said that? Oh, so you do know who said that. <laughs> That's what Barack Obama said when he was running for president four years ago. Turn on your TV, and that is exactly what he has become this year. Ohio's not going to fall for it, are you? No. He can't run on his record. He can't run on the fact that there are 23 million Americans struggling for work today, or that nearly one in six of our fellow citizens are living in poverty today, or that we have a debt crisis right on our horizon because he failed to fulfill his promise to bring people together to solve these big problems because he failed to cut the deficit in half, because he failed to take our country's problems and run at them. Instead, he ran from them and he blamed other people. We cannot afford four more years like this. We can't go down this path. And after getting the runaround for four years, it is about time we got a turnaround. And that's the kind of man Mitt Romney is. The president's not even really running on an agenda for a second term, but we know exactly where we are headed. We know the debt's scheduled to go from $16 trillion to $20 trillion. We got a $2 trillion tax increase staring us in the face. Of all the taxes in Obamacare, there's 21 of them, 12 of them hit middle-income taxpayers. You know, we were leaving Mass today in Dayton, uh, at this beautiful church, Emmanuel, right downtown Dayton. And a nice lady came up to me and said, please tell me you're going to get rid of Obamacare and you're going to get rid of this assault to our religious liberties. And I got to tell you, we are going to get rid of our assault to our religious liberties. There is so much at stake in this election. It really does come down to the kind of country we're going to give our kids and our grandkids, the kind of people we're going to be. Does the, work, does the government work for us or not? Look, we believe in the principles that built this country. We believe in liberty, freedom, free enterprise, self-determination, 
The government works for us and not the other way around. Those are the principles that built this country. We need leaders who understand this. We need leaders who are not afraid to stand up for those founding principles. These are the principles that our founders gave us and that every generation of veterans since had secured for us. Thank you for that. We are, owe you a debt of gratitude. We will honor you by honoring this country's founding principles. And so, of all the things we need, we need leadership. Look, one of my favorite historians just passed away a few weeks ago. And he would always talk about the common qualities that make a great leader at a special time in a nation's history. A person who has a moral compass, a bedrock of principles, a vision for the country, and the ability, the skills, the proven track record to execute that vision. That is Mitt Romney. That is this man in a nutshell. This is a man who, this is a man who did not demonize or demagogue Democrats, but who found common ground, balanced the budget without raising taxes as a Republican governor of a Democratic state. This is a man who, when given responsibility, has fulfilled it. He has succeeded where others have failed. This is a man who turned around struggling businesses, who started small businesses. And by the way, being successful in business, that's a good thing. There is nothing wrong with that. We want more of that. We want more people to be successful. That's how we grow. That's how we get more jobs. That's how we get more take-home pay. That's how we get the American dream within reach of everybody in America. We have a jobs crisis. Wouldn't it be great to have a job creator in the White House? Look, we need your help. We're asking for your vote. On November the 6th, this is your time of choosing. And as you know it, Ohio, as Ohio goes, so goes America. You have a unique responsibility. You have a big opportunity. I think you realize that. And when we look at the big decision we have, it's crystal clear. We are giving you a very clear choice. We can either wake up the next day on November the 7th and look at the TV screen and see that we're going to have to wait four more years for real change or nine more days from now. Four more years or nine more days. I say nine more days. We can do this. Nine more days. That's right. Nine more days to get America back on the right track. Nine more days to put us in the right path. Nine more days, and then the next day we will wake up and we will see that we have elected a leader to lead us. A man that we will be proud to call our president, ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States, Mitt Romney. say thank you Findlay Iowa <laughs> it's good to be with you today uh, and I I owe you a great 
debt of gratitude for, for being here today, for standing, for waiting as long as it takes, I know, to get through the, the mags and to come here to see us. And, and I know there are other things you could be doing today, but you've come here because you care about the country. And I appreciate your generosity of spirit. Thank you. And you heard, uh, you heard some entertainers. I'm not talking about these guys. I'm talking about the, the ones you heard a moment ago. Big and Rich were here and John and Drasic. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, Cowboy Troy was here. He did, did all these guys sing? I didn't get to hear them. Is that right? Gosh, that's just, uh, just amazing. And I appreciate their being here and, and, and supporting this effort. And Lieutenant Governor Taylor was here. And uh, appreciate also the fact that Congressman Latta was here. This is, uh, this is a remarkable, t someone screaming, yeah, yeah, back that. That's the congressman's <laughs> wife, I know. <laughs> and uh, it's a time of celebration for us. It's a time of uh, importance and significance. I know that right now some people in the country are a little nervous about a storm about to hit the coast, and our thoughts and prayers are with the people who will find themselves in harm's way. I'm, uh, I'm heartened by the fact that as I go across the country in very large cities to very small cities, people are turning out in large numbers because they care. They care about this election. They care about the country and the direction of the country. And uh, I, think, I think there's a gathering degree of support across the country as people recognize what's at stake because we face huge challenges as a nation and, and we face uh, huge opportunities. This is a big election. This will be a turning point, in our view. You know, four years ago, the president spoke to the greatness of the times. But over the last four years, he hasn't measured up to what he spoke about. And actually, right now, he's been reduced to talking about smaller and smaller and smaller things. His campaign is about uh, saving characters on Sesame Street and, uh, <laughs> and silly word games and, uh, and attacks day in and day out. And you know, attacking someone does not mean they have an agenda. And we have an agenda to get America back, and we're going to take care of helping the American people who need it. There are, you know, you, you just listened to Paul Ryan talk about some of the differences between where America would be if the president were reelected and where we would take the country instead. And there are big departures between the two, but, but uh, there's something else that I think accounts for the growing interest in this campaign. And that is a recognition of something quite fundamental, which is that the, the president believes everything's going about right, that we're on track, that it's a, you know, stay the course, go forward, he says. I consider that to be more forewarned, all right? My, my own view is that this is a turning point for America, that we need to take a different course, that we cannot stay on the course we're on. I, I happen to think that that the American people understand we need dramatic and real change if we're going to have a bright and prosperous future for us. I mean, do you want, do you want four more years with 23 million Americans struggling to find a good job? No. I mean, do you, want, do you want four more years of higher taxes? No. Do you want four more years where new businesses just aren't starting up? No. Do you want four more years of Obamacare? No. That got the loudest no, I can tell. <laughs> okay, I, I'm absolutely convinced that for America to have a bright and prosperous future, we have to take a different course. And the president says, no, no, we're just going to keep going on the same road we're on. And people can, people, yeah, there's another no. People, can, people can, can determine what the future will be like under President Obama by seeing what it's like right now. And the course he's put us on higher taxes, Obamacare, cutting Medicare by $716 billion, having in place a whole series of tax and regulatory policies that make it harder for small business to start, you know where that ends up. And that ends up hurting you and your family. This is an election about big things, meaning whether we're going to have energy independence and whether America's military is going to be strong and whether our economy will lead the world. But it's also a matter of big things in your life in your homes. And so if you're a senior, for instance, and, or perhaps you're caring for a senior in your home, and, uh, and, and Barack Obama were to be reelected, and let's say you develop a medical condition that requires a medical specialist, and so you call the office of the medical specialist, and the appointment secretary says, 
under Obamacare. I'm sorry we're not taking any more Medicare patients. Because of the cuts that were put on Medicare by Obamacare, we're not taking more Medicare patients. Half the doctors in America surveyed say they won't take more Medicare patients under Obamacare. That's why we will repeal Obamacare and replace it to make sure we honor the promises made to seniors. And if, you're, and if you're a college student here at the University of Findlay or somewhere else that you're going to school and uh, you graduate, one big difference between whether the president's reelected or whether Paul Ryan and I are elected is this. If you graduate and he's your president, good luck finding a job. <laughs> if I'm your president, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure jobs come back and jobs are waiting for college graduates. And by the way, and by the way, when you graduate, you will probably have ten or twenty thousand dollars or perhaps more of student debt. And by the way, that means you'll find out you're going to be paying interest on that for a long time and paying back the principal. But there's some more debt that you don't know about. Over the last four years, the president has borrowed and put on the balance sheet of debt held by the public almost as much debt held by the public as all the prior presidents combined. And that, by the way, that debt won't be paid back by my generation. We'll be long gone. You're going to be paying the interest on that and the principal paid back on that. This is going to be a burden on the graduating classes. Right now, there's $50,000 of debt for every man, woman, and child in America. We think that's wrong. We think it's immoral. That's why we'll get America on track to finally have a balanced budget. And let's say, and let's say you got some kids at home. Let's say you got some kids at home and, and uh, hope you got great schools and you're happy with your school, but if you're concerned that your school isn't measuring up and you're concerned that your child might not have the skills that they need for the future and for the jobs of the future, you might want to be able to pick a charter school or, a, or another public school that you think would be better. But unfortunately, because the president gets most of, well, his largest campaign contribution coming from the teachers' unions, why he doesn't favor the kind of school choice that we favor. What I'm going to do I'm going to take all the federal dollars that come out to help our disabled kids and, and low-income kids, and, and instead of giving that to the school, I'm going to make sure it follows the student so the parent can decide where the student's going to go to school. I, I happen to believe that giving people more freedom and more choice in where their kids go to school will improve their schools and give the kids the kind of education they desire and deserve. Now, there's some other things that will be different in your life, depending on who gets elected. If you're in your 40s and 50s, these are supposed to be your best earning years yet. And uh, that isn't always the case these days. A lot of people are out of work. And a lot of people who have jobs are finding that they can't put money away for retirement. Or they're having a hard time helping out their kids with, uh, with college or other expenses. And that's because uh, there's been this middle class squeeze in this country. The median income in America is down by $4,300 a family. $4,300 a year is a lot to be down. At the same time, gasoline for a family, average family, is up $2,000 a year. And then, of course, to their health insurance premiums, they're up by $2,500 a year. Then electricity prices, food prices. Look, middle-income families that have jobs are getting squeezed under this president. I, I was talking with a with a guy from Waukesha, Wisconsin, a few days ago. He said he had a job at $25 an hour plus benefits. And now the only job he can get is at $8 an hour without benefits. And he's not on the unemployment rolls. He's not one of the 23 million who can't find work, is struggling to find a good job. This, this country is facing some tough times. And so we go to the president. We had three presidential debates and, of course, a vice presidential debate. Was he able to lay out a, a plan to get the economy going and create jobs? No. no. Paul Ryan and I were, because we talked about... What he, 
what he does is he says that he inherited a very difficult economy. That's true, but that's not all he inherited. He also inherited the greatest nation in the history of the earth. He also inherited the biggest economy in the world and the most productive and innovative people in the world. The problem, the problem is not so much what he inherited. The problem is what he did with what he inherited. He didn't make the kinds of changes that got the economy going again. And so his idea for the future is another stimulus and raising taxes. That won't create jobs. Paul Ryan and my five-point, five-step plan will create 12 million new jobs and rising take-home pay, and American people need that kind of leadership. And you know, some of you know by now what those five steps are, but in case you can't remember, I'm going to remind you. Number one, we're going to take full advantage of our oil, our coal, our gas, our nuclear, our renewables. That's number one. And by the way, we'll build that pipeline from Canada to bring more oil into our country. Back in the center of China. Number two, we're going to open up trade with other nations, particularly in Latin America. That means more jobs for us because we can compete anywhere in the world. But I will tell you this as well. If a nation cheats and China's been cheating on trade, we're going to hold them accountable and make that stop. Number three, number three, we're going to have the kind of training that our adult workers need and the kind of schools our kids need. My view, by the way, on education is this. You put the kids and the parents and the teachers first and the teachers' union is going to have to go behind. Number four, number four I've already mentioned, which is balancing our budget. And, and by the way, the reason that's important for job creation is this. You're not going to find entrepreneurs taking their life savings to start a, a business of some kind if they think we're headed to Greece an economic calamity. If You're not going to find big corporations saying, let's come move to Findlay, Ohio, and build a new facility and hire a lot of people if they think America's going to be like Italy or Spain. So we got to show them we're willing to sit down and finally deal with our budget crisis and finally rein in the excess and get ourselves on track to balance budget. So that's why it's important for job creation. That's number four. And number five is this. We need to champion small business. We need to help small business grow and get going. And, and the president, you know, the president talks business every four years, but, but he, doesn't, he doesn't understand it the way you really need, in my view, to understand it, to really understand how hard it is to start a business, what the prospects are for success, which are not great when you start a new business. It's hard work. And the people who come and join that enterprise, they work long hours to make it successful. And by the way, if it is successful, they did build it. Government did not build it. So I, I want to do everything in my power to help small business. The president has some ideas for small business. One is to raise the taxes on small business, all right? On, about, on businesses that, that employ about 25% of America's private sector workforce, he wants to raise their taxes. And that's going to kill jobs. I will not raise taxes on small business, and I will not raise taxes on middle-income families in America. And so we see two very different paths. A president who has no new ideas, no agenda, no plan for getting America's economy working because he thinks everything's going fine right now. He just says forward. We have it on our hand, we've got two guys here, well, more than two. We have how many? Four of us on the stage, at least, who believe that we're at a turning point, that we need to take a different course, that we need to draw, draw on the great qualities of the American spirit to take America in the path that will get America growing again, adding jobs again, raising take-home pay, building small business, and we're going to do it together. Now, for that to happen, for that to happen, Now, 
you know, at some times, perhaps in our nation's history, we could just uh, uh, talk about the opposition party like we have no interest in them and we're going to push them aside. But the truth is, given the scale of the challenges we face and the need for a, a national turning point, for us to be successful in doing the five things I just described and creating the 12 million jobs and rising take-home pay, we need to actually do something people have talked about for a long time, and that is reach across the aisle and work with people in the opposition party and find common ground, find where we can, where we can find people who love America in both parties and work together. Paul Ryan has done that. Paul did that with, with Senator Wyden of, of Oregon, worked together on a proposal to, to make sure that in the next generation we can save Medicare as we have in this generation. I did that in a state of Massachusetts. We, we have a few Democrats in my state, and uh, <laughs> actually, uh, my legislature was 85% Democrat. I think it's the most uh, single-sided legislature in America. And um, when I became, or was when I was governor, when I became elected, it was not lost on me that to get the job done, I had to work with people on, in the other party. And, and we had a multi-billion dollar budget problem, budget gap. And uh, we didn't battle each other. We found ways to, to make ourselves work together. We actually cut spending. Can you imagine? We didn't just slow down the rate of growth of spending. We cut spending. And then we... Uh, and, we uh, and we cut taxes, too. We cut taxes 19 times. We wanted to make our state as attractive as it could be for entrepreneurs and businesses so we could create more investment and jobs in our state. We did this together. Republicans and Democrats have to do this together. I will go to Washington with Paul Ryan. We will we'll meet regularly with Democrat leaders, Republican leaders, and battle on the issues that matter most and find common ground where, where they're able to keep their principles and we can keep ours because it matters. Look, the country is in, in a critical time and we need that kind of leadership. And I know I know it's there. I know it's there. I, I've seen the great qualities of the human spirit evidenced in the American people. I, I see it in the men and women who serve in our military. We don't, uh, we don't ask them. We, we don't ask them what party they're from. When they're, when they're standing up in, in harm's way to defend our freedoms, we don't say, well, are you a Republican or a Democrat or are you an Independent? They're an American, and we come together, and that's what we need to have in this country again, is that kind of leadership that brings these great qualities together. I love, uh, I love one of the verses in one, one of our national hymns, America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country love, and mercy more than life. Would our veterans please raise your hands and members of the armed forces. Thank you, sir. It seems to be a, a quality of the American spirit to live for something bigger than yourself, as those men and women in uniform do. I, I remember when I was a Boy Scout leader some years ago, I was at a court of honor. And a court of honor is where the Boy Scouts get their Eagle Scout awards or, or other awards. And I was at the front of the room at a Formica table. I was seated towards the end next to an American flag. And the person who was at the microphone speaking was the scoutmaster from Monument, Colorado. And, um, and he was talking about a flag his Boy Scout troop purchased that they wanted to have as a very special flag. It was a pretty good size with gold tassels around it. They had it flown to the Capitol, put above the Capitol building. When it came home, the boys said, hey, I wonder if we could get, have it go up with the space shuttle, make it even more special. So they contacted NASA and said, would you take our flag? And they agreed. He said, you can't imagine how proud the boys were to be watching TVs in their homerooms at school, knowing that on that shuttle, shuttle launch of the shuttle Challenger that, uh, that their flag was on board. And they saw that launch occur, and then suddenly the shuttle exploded in the air. And he said he, uh, he called NASA about two weeks later. 
and asked had they found any remnant of their flag. And they hadn't. He said every week for months he called them. Still no, no flag. Then one day he was reading in the newspaper an article about some of the debris that had been lost in the Challenger disaster. And they had down there a mention of a flag. So he called and NASA confirmed that they had something they wanted to present to the Boy Scout troop. So NASA came with the boys and uh, NASA gave to the boys this plastic box. And they opened it up and there was their flag in perfect condition. And, uh, and then he said, and that's it in the flagpole next to Mr. Romney. And I reached over to that flag and grabbed it and sort of pulled it out. And it was as if electricity was running through my arm because I thought of the men and women in our space program who had uh, walked in dangerous path for us, for learning, for knowledge, pioneers. It's the American way where we live for something bigger than ourselves, like these servicemen and women, like these astronauts. I think of my sister. My sister's uh, uh, in her 70s. Her husband passed away just a couple of years ago. And uh, she has eight kids. Her, uh, her, the first seven of those kids are all married with children of their own. The eighth was born Down syndrome. And Jeffrey's now 43. And Lynn lives her life to care for Jeffrey, to make sure he has a full and abundant life. And has for the past 43 years. She's a hero to me. I think of moms like that who give of themselves to their kids. I think of single moms who right now are having a hard time making ends meet in many cases. And they, so they scrimp and they save to make sure they can have a good meal on the table for their child or children at the end of the day. I think of moms and dads, by the way, that, that are doing two jobs right now. Or perhaps uh, one has a day shift and the other a night shift. And they're doing all this so they can have enough money to buy clothes for their kids to be able to look like the other kids at school. And then there are the couples who this year have decided they're not going to exchange gifts again because they want to be able to give to their kids a great Christmas. We, we are a people who are known for our willingness to live for something bigger than ourselves, for our children, for our family, for our community, for our school, for our nation. It's what makes, in some ways, this nation so exceptional, our selflessness are willing to sacrifice for greatness. This is a time for that. This is a time of great challenge, as I said. It's a big election. We're counting on you. Finley, Ohio may well be the place that decides who the next president is. I need you to vote. I need you to get out there and do what's necessary to get America back. We're counting on you. This country needs it. You can provide it. Get out and vote early. Make sure we take back this country. I love you. I need you. Let's take back America and keep it the hope of the earth. Thank you so very much. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Driving down the street today, I saw a sign for lemonade. They were the cutest kids I'd ever seen in this front yard. As they handed me my glass, smiling, thinking to myself, man, what a picture perfect postcard this would make of America. It's a high school prom, it's a Springsteen song.